yeah, he just totally misunderstands everything. No one can tell him he's wrong. And he's gone so far as to file a federal lawsuit over it. A rejected law school student, who I guess is not a law school student because he got rejected, has sued his schools for violating the Magna Carta. Now, you may be forgiven for forgetting what in the world the Magna Carta is. I kind of forget as well. It was uh, it was one of an early, early set of laws, I believe. It was a declaration from the people of Britain that the king was going to be overseen by a parliament. It was it was the document that established parliament, essentially. Excellent. OK, so it is ba the basic establishment of law in in old England. And that would also then make it the basic establishment and history and etymology of law for the U.S., because that's what our system is based on as well. We don't have a Magna Carta, but we based our constitution on the English system of law at the time and then made our tweaks to it. So it was it was a derivative work, you could say. So a unfortunate individual who did not like the fact that he has to take the LSATs has filed a lawsuit claiming that all of these entities are in violation of the law. He has also written his complaint in memory of Eleanor Roosevelt. May she rest in peace. Take judicial cognizance of the following. Edward Thomas Kennedy plaintiff is one of the people in the court of record, wishes and demands individual defendants in their counsel or their counsel to reply, testify, affirm, declare under penalty of perjury. Justice demands this. The Supreme Court of the United States hires law clerk assistance for its common law judges. Plaintiff believes American Bar Association in 1947 promised Eleanor Roosevelt in their private membership associations members would comply with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. The business model and terms and conditions of defendants, American Bar Association, California Bar Association, and Pennsylvania Bar Association restrains trade in legal advice and services and prevents the plaintiff from earning a living by providing said legal services and legal advice. LSAT tests today are junk science and called games. No objective science supports the current LSAT test. If you are unfamiliar, the LSATs are the law school aptitude test, and it's like the SATs for law school. And it's a basic requirement for applying to law school. Kennedy objects to the Latin slang phrase pro se and requests CM ECF access. Uh, pro se means he's representing himself and he requests access to the court's electronic filing system. There are procedures for this, like he just has to fill out a form. The LSAT test is based on ideology rather than science and is planned, organized, coordinated, budgeted, administered by radicals who ignore our law, our history, our culture, our ethics, and probably all Western civilization law. By defendants' definition and application of the word diversity, defendants are allowing historical and cultural preversions to receive, I'm assuming he meant perversions, to receive special status in United States law school admissions, practices, and procedures in violation of our law, our culture, and the law of this case. But it appears his biggest beef is that he refused to take the June LSAT and then applied to Duke University Law School and then was denied with them saying, we do not have a required LSAT score, so we are withdrawing your file at this time. You're welcome to reapply to the 2019 entering class. They said review the application and checklist and instructions, and that would mean get your LSAT scores in. Now he objects, saying that they stole access to private data such as school transcripts. They stole funds from him, rejected his applications. <sighs> He says they have a duty to not be 
not cause him harm under color of law or loss of liberty. Let me tell you something, guys. If you write a complaint like this <clears throat> and you can't complete the basic requirements of applying to law school, you can't be a lawyer. You don't get to be a lawyer and there is no conspiracy against you. If you can't even conform yourself to very basic and reasonable requirements at law without getting a, a paranoia complex about how, look at this, I mean, he goes into it. Power is never without responsibility. Authority derives in part from government's thumb on the scales. The exercise of that power by private persons becomes in, akin to the exercise of the government itself. This is this is in, this is insane. This is up there with with Matt Haas and and with some of the other pro se's that we've seen. Wow, it's starting. It's sounding suspiciously like sovereign citizen language. Yeah, it does. It sounds a lot like sovereign citizen language. And as someone who loves psychometrics, what's sad is like there's this little kernel of truth that the SATs and the LSATs and things like that are not as predictive of career success as we want them to be. Um, they, they basically test how good you are at taking tests and at like they predict how good you're gonna be in school up to a certain degree. But then there are other things like life skills and support system and access to resources and like, did you get mono in the middle of a semester that really like messed you up? And all of those things can affect your grades as well. Um, so if he's saying the LSATs are not super predictive of how well you're going to do in law school, well, yeah, but they're, they're, they're part of the puzzle. And if you have a thousand applicants and you can only admit 200, yeah. how else are you going to rank them? So how else are you going to determine who should get in and who should? He goes on to advance a restraint of trade cause of action, saying that because bar associations have a monopoly over practicing law, that that is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. I, I, I think that the monopoly over practicing law is not held by the Pennsylvania Bar Association, but is held by the Pennsylvania Bar. To, I understand it's confusing, but those are two separate entities. The Bar Association is not a government actor, although the argument could be made in certain cases. The Pennsylvania Bar is the government actor. And so the restraint of trade allegations should be made against the Pennsylvania Bar. But no, licensing people for a job is not a monopoly over that job. Otherwise, I could just go be an electrician. I could just go be a surgeon. I could just go be whatever I wanted to be. And I could go advertise my services in the yellow pages or the local whatever, or just shout it around town. Leonard French here to do a kidney transplant available today. And nobody could stop me because then you'd be limiting, uh, you know, my ability to have liberty or whatever. And you'd be limiting trade. Well, of course you're limiting trade. The question isn't whether it's a restraint on trade. The question is whether it's an illegal restraint on trade. This person cannot be a lawyer, by the way. This person should never, ever, ever be a lawyer unless they have somehow become a completely different person. Sorry, my humble opinion. If you can't put these things together that this is not a grand conspiracy against you personally, you are suffering from some kind of illness. He alleges bad faith, dishonest acts by not fulfilling contractual obligations, negligence, defines negligence as conduct that falls below the standard established by law for the protection of others against unreasonable risk of harm. Yeah, except that there has to be a duty of care. There's no there's nothing in here that alleges what the duty of care was, so he forgot that. Common law Trevor. I don't even remember what Trevor is. What the heck is Trevor? Common law action to recover the value of personal property. Okay. So he has claimed that they stole his application fees because he applied, paid fees, and then they didn't grant him his application. It's an application fee. You don't get it back. I mean, this is like obvious to everyone else, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the cost of processing the application to pay the people that process applications and stuff like that. 
it's pretty obvious. His relief that he requests is $1,000 for each day of unlawful behavior from each defendant or $500,000 from each defendant, whichever is greater. $5,000 for each failure to act, $1 million from each defendant, a declaratory judgment that the defendants have acted arbitrarily and capriciously, have abused their discretion and have not acted in accordance with law, that the court enter declaratory judgments that they have, defendants have acted contrary to constitutional right, power, or privilege, and to order Betsy DeVos. What? and the said defendant state law schools to admit plaintiff to said schools for both 2018 and 2019 tuition free. He's just throwing random- What the music. heck does Betsy DeVos have to do with it? Betsy DeVos oversees public education, as in grade school education in the US. No, I don't agree with her being the secretary of education, but she is not in charge of law schools. The fact that this person is of law school age and is applying to law schools and is able to pay for law schools and complete a law school application while not noticing that they aren't completing the requirements of law, while assuming that they will be somehow granted all of these privileges without having done the same things that their future classmates had to do, that this person just doesn't have awareness of the world on a level where they should even be operating a vehicle or taking medication or watching over an animal, let alone have the responsibility of advising someone on how to best get through their case. I'm super concerned. <laughs> this man is not woke. This man is not woke. Defendants exceeded its jurisdiction by allowing employees to deny Kennedy admissions to its law schools. Each lawbreaker exceeded their jurisdiction by either directly through an agent or in concert with another, did cause Kennedy to be unlawfully injured against his will without jurisdiction or good cause. Said lawbreakers without good cause harmed Kennedy. From the moment he was harmed till the present, not until, just till. Kennedy, under color of law, was kept in constructive financial imprisonment. Although he objected to the assumed jurisdiction, those who kept him financially imprisoned under color of law did not respond to any of his demands and requests for proof of jurisdiction or for reinstatement of his liberty or the return of property from Kennedy. They continued to assume the jurisdiction without proof of jurisdiction or any attempt at proof of jurisdiction. Kennedy continues to be subject under color of law to assumed jurisdiction, will, and control of the lawbreakers, for he has not been accepted to U.S. schools. So because he didn't get the outcome that he wanted, that means that they've automatically financially imprisoned him constructively, that they have assumed jurisdiction, that they have not reinstated his liberty, which I guess assumes that they have taken his liberty, and they've taken his property, which I'm assuming was the fees that we saw. Each defendant acted in such a way or failed to act in such a way that Kennedy is deprived of his liberty. Each defendant acted to deprive Kennedy of his liberty or each defendant failed to act to prevent the loss by Kennedy of his liberty. He does not understand what liberty is. Liberty is my ability to walk out my front door and walk down the street. That is my constitutional right to go walk around and do stuff to be a person, to have the liberty to do stuff. Liberty does not go beyond that. It does not mean that I don't have to complete requirements of law or that if limitations are imposed by the law, that it is infringing on my liberty illegally. You shall have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not the unfettered right to never have anything ever, ever said to you or done to you in a limiting fashion whatsoever by the law in any way. That would be anarchy. How would government have any power whatsoever if no one could ever encroach on another's liberty? It's not the encroachment of liberty that's automatically a problem. It's the illegal encroachment of liberty that is the problem. And this person does not understand that distinction. I think he, he might have a hard time being a lawyer if he... Um, wants absolutely everything sort of justified and liberty like could you imagine him trying to do 
like trying to submit something to a federal court and not looking up the rules about what's the font what's the margin sizes does it have to be double spaced like there are all of these finicky rules and you have to look up what are the judges rules what are the court's rules what are you know the state's rules about everything yeah being a lawyer requires looking up all of these requirements not all of them always make sense some of them are like left over from doing things by hand and with typewriters mm -hmm. but you know what you do it so that yep. you don't get your motion thrown out for a dumb reason and if you want to make an argument like this i i i hear what he's saying and i too have some concerns that maybe there isn't a good enough access to justice by the public because there aren't enough good lawyers or the good lawyers that we have can't operate around the country easy enough because of some of these restrictions. However, no judge is going to approve overhauling the system on these facts. The, the, so let's back up for a second because I'm just kind of flabbergasted and speechless here. This person hasn't alleged any specific facts. They've said that they applied to law school that they didn't complete the requirements of those applications, that the schools rejected them, and that the schools kept their money, and that this somehow violates their rights. You have to be more particular than that. They've got the, those basic facts are fine. Those basic facts sound like something happened. I can, I, can, I can figure out the story. I can figure out what's going on. Now you have to make a legal claim, and your legal claim can't just be, well, that's negligent or, well, that's, that's illegal color of law. First of all, color of law isn't a, a law. He's talking about 42 USC 1983, and at least I think he is, and there's more to that statute than just under color of law. Certain things have to happen under color of law, but they, there's other stuff. It has to be illegal, has to be proximately caused, etc. So he has to allege all of that, and he hasn't. He hasn't alleged all of that. He simply said, they did these things, they ignored me, and they have now breached something and they owe me money. Yeah, you hurt my feelings is not a legal complaint. It's not a sustainable one. So these defendants in Delaware, why are we in Delaware? These defendants, some of them will respond, um, and I'm assuming they will respond with a motion to dismiss, and the motion to dismiss will go something like this. The plaintiff has failed to meet the basic prima facie case for any of these causes of actions, and therefore no reasonable jury or judge could find for them on any of these facts whatsoever, even if these facts are taken to be correct. Even if everything this person says is correct, there is no way that this person wins a case. There's no legal claim here. In other words, it's not that he's not making a claim, and it's not that he's not making a claim that under the color of law. It's he's not making a claim that the law actually recognizes. So that's where the motion to dismiss would come in. A 12b6 motion, for example. 12b6 for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So even if these things are all true, none of these things are violations of law upon which a judge can grant a legal remedy. And that's the problem with Edward Thomas Kennedy's complaint, in my humble opinion. I think that he doesn't understand the things that he needs to learn at law school, and maybe he should spend some more time learning the basic requirements of applying to law school and conforming himself to them so that he can advance his education in the law. However, the second half of that is, it is very expensive to go to law school and you will find yourself very much in debt if you drop out of law school or even if you complete your degree and earn your bar and, and get your license and yeah, so I'm still in a lot of debt, like $300,000 worth of debt. But I have a high paying job that I can, I can potentially handle that better. I can do public service work to pay that off or I can get a high paying job or something. It's even harder when you don't have your law degree and you don't have your law license and you don't have law training 
and you still have law school debts. So my harsh and blunt recommendation is that Edward Thomas Kennedy quits while he's ahead and does not go to law school and incur said debts because my opinion and I don't like talking down to people. I really don't, guys. Please don't take this the wrong way. But my opinion is that he would not survive law school and would not be a good lawyer. And it would be the beginning of a worse time for him, not a better one. All based on the way he wrote this complaint. The judgment call to write this complaint and file it like this and do these things this way. That shows a terrible lack of judgment. An almost insurmountable lack of judgment. I almost don't think that a person will change enough in their lifetime to overcome that amount of lack of judgment. I think his fundamental flaw is that he reads the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as like the right to have it given to him. But no, it's the right to earn your right, your life, liberty, and your happiness. So it's not, you, you don't just get to be happy. You have you are unfettered to yeah. be happy. You are allowed to earn happiness. It doesn't mean that the government is going to give it to you. Did he have a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress in there? Oh, good one. Yeah, let's um let's let's go and look at that again and let's list some of these things that he doesn't have in here. So he has in here quoted transgender normalizing mental illness. Great. I'm sure that will uh, be a fun thing for some of our viewers to see that he has he has quoted that video. He has made an action for trespass, which looks like common law trespass. Plea of trespass, trespass on the case, vicarious liability, failure to provide a Republican form of government, and false advertising. Oh, this is this is starting to go deep. This is this is layers worse than I thought. Yeah. Trespass yeah. on the case, vicarious liability. Okay, here we go. Yeah, on page seven of one of his exhibits, he quotes, 1297 by Edward, King of England, reaffirms that the Magna Carta may be pleaded as the common law before a court. This links the Magna Carta to the common law. And so he thinks he can cite the Magna Carta. Does he not know that he lives in America, which is a separate entity from that? So he cited the Magna Carta in his exhibit, not in the complaint. The writ, which is called a precipi, shall not be served on anyone for any holding so as to cause a free man to lose his court. Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that archaic language means, but I can pick it apart. So the writ is like a, a, a piece of process or, 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 or legal notice of some kind. Um, precipi is one of those writs. Uh, a precipi is just a kind of request to the court. Precipi kind of means request, but we use the phrase archaically because we now know that we're always talking about a court precipi rather than a request. So I can make a request to the court, but that's different from making a precipi. I know what a precipi is. It's a formal request to the court. So, shall not be served on anyone for any holding so as to cause a free man to lose his court. Well, serving on anyone for any holding, well, a holding would be a decision. To cause a free man to lose his court. Well, we are talking about slaves and everything, so there are slaves, so a free man would be a, would be a free person like you or I nowadays. Losing his court would be lose his court of jurisdiction. Or it could mean his lordship's court, as in holding court, as in holding his own uh, tip staff and, and, and his own lordship's domain. So either it means literally jurisdiction in a court or it literally means the lord's court, like losing his stuff. Either way, so it touches on his rights. The precipi shall not be served on anyone for any decision, any court decision that would cause a man to lose property or rights, is what that says. You cannot simply violate someone's right to go to court. This is due process. This paragraph 67, in my humble opinion, because I don't know the Magna Carta, 
I'm gonna guess this paragraph 67 that's being as being quoted from the from the Magna Carta would be early versions of what we call today your due process or your right to a legal process that is due to you under the law that protects your rights to go to court and have a fair and meaningful interaction with an unbiased tribunal. So yeah, he just totally misunderstands everything. No one can tell him he's wrong. And he's gone so far as to file a federal lawsuit over it. What bar in their right mind after this document would even accredit him? I, I, like, I have half a mind to keep a Google alert on this person. And every time I see him apply to something to send this to them to try and make sure that no one ever gives this person a real job with real responsibility over real people. I am hoping that this is a person who suffers from serious illness and simply cannot be aware of what they're writing. Otherwise, if this is an intelligent person who has simply believed these things so much that they wrote this document, that's scarier that's scarier than a person who's ill and not getting help for it. And I don't say that lightly, guys. I don't, this is not something I say lightly. This is, oh good, oh goodness, there's even more in here. This is what he calls the law of the case. Okay, I think this is his understanding of law. Guys, I thought, I didn't realize there was more. I'm sorry, let's keep going. Statutes and codes shall be the rules of decision so long as they are not in conflict with common law. In a court of record, a judge has no discretion. Discretion is reserved to the independent tribunal. When the word law is used without qualification, it means common law. An attorney at law means one who practices common law. An attorney at equity is one who practices before an equity court. Oh God, guys, this is just getting worse. Remember how I've had struggled with the difference between law and equity and which courts are which and all that? They were merged. There is no longer a court of law and a court of equity. There hasn't been for a very long time. Remember, he's talking to a judge now. Absolute judicial immunity is a myth. A judge does not have absolute immunity. Judicial immunity does not apply when the judge is performing a non-judicial act or acts in the complete absence of all jurisdiction. Statutes are expressions of will from the legislature to maintain confusion, period to maintain confusion, period. Bar members append the word law to it. Naturally, one is supposed to believe that statutory law is the same and equal to common law. It isn't, exclamation point. There is no legislative foundation for any bar member to practice law. Codes are nothing more than a collection of statutes and other rules arranged by subject instead of being arranged by date. Law beats statutes, statutes beat codes. The California 1879 Constitution defines all California courts to be courts of record. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania maintains confusion and deception with multiple versions of its constitution. Has had five versions of the Pennsylvania Constitution. 1776, 1790, 1838, 1874, and 1968. Yes, I'm sure that this is done solely to cause confusion. This is like an episode of Dragon Ball Z where it just keeps escalating. You know what I mean? It's like ridiculous. <laughs> where it is essential. Whereas it is essential if a man not be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. This is from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Nisi Prius is defined as a court where civil actions are tried by a single judge sitting with a jury as distinguishable from a appellate court. This means the Nisi Prius court is a trial court, which of course is where the facts of the case are discovered. A Nisi Prius court is a court of no record, but a record is kept in a trial court. The mere keeping of a record does not qualify any court to be a court of record. So, so far we can determine that he had like Black's Law Dictionary beside him, and perhaps that he's read some Sovset stuff. Wow. Yeah, Sovset stuff, definitely. Black's Law Dictionary contributes to the confusion by listing only two of the four requirements for a court to qualify as a court of record. 
which he does not list here. Oh, sorry, that's it. Wow. Okay, so yes, it's up to the state to define courts of record. Courts of record simply mean that they keep records of the proceedings. They have a court reporter, and court reporter keeps records. They keep evidence. They keep a file. That's what that means. It means there's an official record of all proceedings before the court. In California, all courts are named as courts of record. Um, I'll add in here, for example, in Pennsylvania, I was just in a magisterial district court, and that is not a court of record in Pennsylvania. The opposing counsel had to bring her own stenographer. However, if an individual, if in an individual case they are not operated as courts of record, they don't qualify as such. It takes more than a name to make a court of record. Even though a court may be keeping a record, it is a court of no record if it does not conform to the remaining three requirements for a lawful court of record. A court of record must have a seal, a power to fine or imprison for contempt, must keep records of the proceedings, uh, must proceed according to the common law and not statutes or codes and the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. I really don't know what that last part means, if they literally mean like the court system is separate from the individual judges in it. That's normal. He says, note that a judge is a magistrate and is not the tribunal. The tribunal is either the sovereign himself or a fully empowered jury not paid by the government. Okay, so now he's setting up the argument that if the jury receives compensation for their day, then that means they're not a jury. That's what he's going to say, I think. Black's Law Dictionary omissions are subtle, but one can recombine the information to get the real meaning of terms such as nisi prius. Um, so Black's Law Dictionary is not a record, is not a authority. Courts definitely will cite Black's Law Dictionary as being a good dictionary authority, but a dictionary does not overrule definitions of law in the law. In other words, if the state of New Jersey defines a loaded firearm as a firearm that is in the same container as its ammunition, that becomes the legal definition, whether or not it makes any freaking sense. So if you go to New Jersey and you have the bullets in one box and you have the gun in a different box, but the two boxes are in a bigger box, or even if the state of, the state of New Jersey just happens to think the car is a container, Guess what? You're in possession of a loaded firearm, even though the bullets aren't in the gun. You can't use Black's Law Dictionary to look up what New Jersey law is. You can, look black, you can use Black's Law Dictionary as a persuasive source to persuade a judge to argue before a judge that a word means a certain thing. But if there is a legal definition of that word, that legal definition overcomes, is superior and reigns supreme. Nisi Prius is a Latin term. It means first, we labored first. Nisi means unless. Nisi, mean, Nisi Prius means unless first. Okay. The word is often affixed as a kind of elliptical expression to the words rule, order, decree, judgment, confirmation. Nisi Prius court is a court which with which we'll proceed unless a party objects. The agreement to proceed is obtained from the party first. Uh, no. I don't even know the words Nisi Prius, but I'm going to guess that a Nisi Prius court is a court of first impression. And the determination of whether you're in the correct court is made by the law of jurisdiction. It is true that parties could consent to a court or other jurisdiction that they are not required to be in by law, but it's not what he's saying here. It is a matter of right that one may demand to be tried by a court of record by sheer definition this means that the court must proceed according to the common law, not statutory law. The only way that a court can suspend that right is by the prior agreement of the parties. For tactical reasons, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and or the state and or the state prefers to proceed according to statutory law than common law. The only way it can do that is to obtain the prior agreement from the parties. That is the primary but hidden purpose of the arraignment procedure. <laughs> oh my god. He <laughs> misunderstands arraignment. The arraignment is part of your due process notice requirements. You are arrested and you are hauled before the court, and this is where the court 
tells you your rights, tells you the charges, tells you what the schedule is. So the arraignment is just your notice, your official notice from the judge of the charges in the case so that you don't have to rely on a police officer to give it to you or the mail or something like that. If you're charged with a, with a grievous enough offense, you'll be hauled before the judge and the judge will arraign you. At all hours of the night, too, we have judges on call in Pennsylvania. And when Juan Carlos Burgos Santiago got arrested for impersonating a police officer and terroristic threats against me, they found him and arrested him in the middle of the night, and they took him before Judge Karen Devine in the middle of the night, or no, it was Judge Pat Engler in the middle of the night, and she arraigned him. She told him what his five charges were, she told him what his bail was, she told him what the next court appearance was going to be, and she sent him home, or to jail, depending upon whether he paid his bond. If it was unsecured, then he's out on bond, and I believe that's what happened. So, that is what arraignment's for. This is not, arraignment is not some strange way to get you to accidentally agree to the court system's jurisdiction. I, you can go, you can go to an arraignment. It, nothing like that is even mentioned. During arraignment, choices for pleading are only guilty, not guilty, nolo contandra, and they lead to the same jurisdiction, namely statutory jurisdiction, not a common law violation. Yes. Let me explain this to him. If you're guilty, you can plead guilty, and yes, you're agreeing to the to the judge to the jurisdiction of the court. If you are either not guilty factually because you didn't commit the offense, or if you are not guilty because of some procedural or technical or jurisdictional violation, you're also not guilty. Nolo contandra is guilty but no contest meaning you're not going to admit wrongdoing, but you also admit that you won't win the case. This might seem like a dumb question, but why is he talking about, about a, a bunch of criminal law stuff if he's civilly suing a law school? Yep, you got me. I don't know. I think he's just trying to put as many words on the paper as possible to like try to throw the, the person reading it off kilter. Yeah, sometimes people who have these kinds of illnesses uh, or these kinds of behaviors, they are unable to to see that others have a different perspective. I'm going to assume that this plaintiff is more or less stuck in his worldview. And he assumes that everyone else must have the same information or worldview and must just be acting in their own best interest differently. You know, be, because it must, must be acting differently because it's in their own best interest. This person feels an awful lot like they're stuck in that same kind of narrow worldview in which I was stuck, and that they have, they're not going to get out of this unless they can open their mind, which is very difficult to do when you're the one who's stuck, unless they can get help and open their mind to learning that they aren't right about everything, basically. The dictionary does not lie. It emits important information. It says that a court has been set up, that has been set up by prior agreement, assumed because when the three statutory options were presented to the defendant, he chose one. He thus failed to enforce his right to be prosecuted in a court of record. Okay, well, this guy trusts the dictionary, but he apparently doesn't trust American movies because everybody's seen movies or videos or TV shows or whatever where the defendant doesn't want to enter a plea. My cousin Vinny's one of them. And the lawyer gets thrown in jail because he's in contempt of court because he's not participating in the arraignment proceeding. Your answers are either guilty or not guilty, or I guess nolo contandra is a, a version of guilty, sure. But uh, you're either guilty or not guilty, or you're in contempt of court. That's it. It's a binary choice. This is the procedure. They tell you what's going on. You tell them what's going on. You're either going to be proceeding as a guilty person, or you're going to be proceeding as a not guilty person. It is not a place where you say facts and circumstances, and I did this, and they didn't do this, and no. No, no, no. The arraignment is the place where you hear things, and you answer guilty or not guilty. 
That's it. Once the agreement, as evidenced in the arraignment proceeding, has been secured, the court proceeds under statutory authority. Now the court ceases to be a court of record and becomes a court of no record by prior lack of objection, by prior agreement implied by failure to object. This, the paragraph's wrong, but the concept is not. You can waive things in court by not objecting to them in time. That's mostly for trial procedure and for pretrial procedure. Certainly there would be a place to maybe bring up an objection at an arraignment, but I'm trying to think of what objection you might bring up at an arraignment that if you didn't is waived. I'm not thinking of any, but I'm not a criminal defense attorney, but that's what that's about. Naturally, after securing the agreement, the Nisi Prius court can move on to examine the facts with a judge and jury. The criminal court is an inferior court because it is operating according to a special criminal code and not according to the common law. It's both. This guy doesn't get it. The statutory law and the common law both exist. They are both good law. I can argue common law defamation in the same complaint that I can, law, I can argue statutory law defamation. The judge will not grant me relief twice. The judge will read the two of them as being similar and will grant me the relief once, even if both sets of law are met. <clears throat> even if its name is superior court of, it is still an inferior court so long as it is operating according to some code or statutes rather than common law. On the other hand, a court of record, so long as it meets the criteria, is a true superior court. The decisions and proceedings of an inferior court are not presumed to be valid. The inferior court can be sued in a superior court, a collateral attack. In other words, the superior court outranks the inferior court not of record. Government manipulation of language. The first trick of the government is the redefinition of certain critical words in each statute the government assumes the ordinary meaning of the word, so uh, I guess there was a period supposed to be in there. The government assumes the ordinary meaning of the word so as to trick the public into reading and interpreting a statute in their favor. Here's a summary of trick words. Two keywords that are redefined in almost every statute are the words person and individual. There are at least two person in law. A natural person is a legal entity for the human being. An artificial person is the legal entity for that is not a human being. And then he is getting the definition from Barron's Canadian Law Dictionary. Does anybody remember how Canadian law applies to the U.S.? I, I don't remember. A natural person has the capacity for rights and duties, but not the obligation. The artificial person has rights and duties that may be attached by laws. A second trick of the government is to use the Interpretation Act to define words that apply to all statutes, unless redefined within a particular statute. And again, he turns to the Canadian Law Dictionary, Income Tax Act, and Canadian Human Rights Acts. Let me page down here and see what the hell he, where the hell he's going with this. Wait, he called himself a free man before, right? Yeah. Or made reference to This a is all man? sovereign citizen crap, isn't it? Yeah, because in Canada, sovereign citizens are often called free men on the land. Yeah, they're called that here too. Yeah. And Australia. So this is a sovereign citizen thing. I, I understand that we, we could read this forever, but it does go on for five whole more pages. Um, so he goes on further about courts of record having inferior dignity. A court of record is a judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions. He quotes the Magna Carta. No state of the United States shall join unless it is a republic. I'm assuming he's going to then argue that we're not a republic. No rulemaking or legislation can abrogate rights using Miranda or uh, Miranda for yeah, the, yeah using the Miranda case. There can be no sanction or penalty opposed upon one because of this exercise of constitutional rights. That's not what Shearer v. Cullen said. I don't need to read it. I know that's what it did say. Republican government, one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and are exercised by the people either directly or through representatives chosen by the people to whom the powers were specifically delegated. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is an inseparable part of the United States of America and the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Constitution of the laws of the United States shall be made in pursuance thereof and the treaties thereof with under authority of the United States, supreme law of the land. 
Conspiracy against rights. If two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyments of any privilege or right secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, or because of his having so exercised the same, if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another with the intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise of enjoyment of any rights or privileges so secured, they shall be fined under this ruler title. And he goes into kidnapping, sexual abuse, attempt to kill, and, oh, about being sentenced to death, okay. Deprivation of rights under color of law, under 18 USC, he says 242. Whoever under color of law, statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, willfully subjects any person, state, territory, etc., to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States shall be subject to further legal action. Court, the person and suit of the sovereign, the place where the sovereign sojourns with his regal retinue, from Black's Law Dictionary. An agency of the sovereign, created by, directly or indirectly, under its authority, consisting of one or more officers, etc. Court of record. To be a court of record, a court must have four characteristics, may have a fifth. Exercising power, proceeding according to common law, <laughs> which he has incorrectly interpreted is to mean only common law. It's not what that says. It says proceeds according to the course of common law. It doesn't say and to the exclusion of statutory law. Let's not say that. Its acts and judicial proceedings are enrolled, recorded for perpetual memory and, and testimony. Yes, that's a court of record and power to fine or imprison or contempt. Yes, judges generally have an unlimited power to fine or imprison for contempt. However, like we saw before, it's not for, you know, not just anything is contempt but they do have the power. The following persons are magistrates, judges of superior courts, justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which have under the laws of our land shall allow. And this is American Bar Foundation, California Penal Code. If any claim, statement, fact, or portion of this action is held inapplicable or not valid, such decision does not affect the validity of the other portion of this action. Because he said it, it must be true. The singular includes the plural and the plural the singular. The present tense includes the past and future tenses and the future, the present. The masculine gender includes the feminine and the neuter. Uh, that's what I, that's what I, okay. So he was just referring to, you know, you can't get rid of my case because I accidentally said they or she when I meant he. Okay. We, the people of the United States, in order for a perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of Liberty, ourselves, do ordain and establish the Constitution. For Did he just literally quote the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America? Correct. I'm pretty sure the judge doesn't need to be taught that. We, the people of this state, do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. There's, there's that is. He does not yield his sovereignty. Through the courts, plaintiff encourages the government to obey the law. Edward Thomas Kennedy plaintiff is one of the people and in the court of record wishes and determines individual defendants and their counsel to reply and testify a firm declare under penalty of perjury to his complaint. Wow. So let me tell you what he's trying to do here. When you go on to a court's website, every lawyer has to do this. Even tactical bra has had to do this recently. When you go on to a court's website for a new court system that you've never practiced law in, you have to start reading rules. There are judges' rules, there are court system rules, there are state rules, and then if you're in the federal court system, there are federal rules. There are state rules of civil procedure, there are federal rules of civil procedure that are separate from the state laws and federal laws and common law. So you have to know no less than six bodies of law to walk into one courtroom. This person does not get that. They think that the Magna Carta can override the Constitution, can override whatever, or that a common law overrides a statutory law, overrides a code. Well, a code is just a name for a statutory law. Statutory law, code. It's statutory because it's made by statute. It's code because it's a code. 17 USC 505, that's a code. It means something. It's a citation. You look it up. It means it's the 17th title of the United States Code, Section 505, which means you got to go find the U.S. Code. You got to go find Title 17. You got to go find Section 505. 
You're not, you're not losing liberty because I made you look up something. You're failing to conform yourself to the basic requirements of law. You are not governing yourself or your case according to the basic requirements of your state and federal jurisdictions. So what Mr. Kennedy here has done is he has written one of his own law of the case. He has written his own law of the case here and tried to pass this off as if it's one of those sets of rules that a judge has to obey. That because the judge has to obey the state law and the procedural law and the judge's rules and the Magna Carta and the Constitution, that that means that the judge also has to obey Edward Kennedy's laws. Edward Thomas Kennedy? Yeah, Edward Kennedy's laws. That's not true. What actually happens is Edward Kennedy is responsible for looking up those laws. And basically, if he had simply attached those laws to the end of this thing, which is unnecessary, and if he had written this thing under those laws, it'd be fine. I don't think he'd have a claim either, but it, it would be a lot more coherent because it wouldn't be citing disconnections from things and, and all that. It would be able to make the connections. This person simply doesn't have a legal education, and so they couldn't tell you what these laws are. Imagine if I tried to write this before law before I went to law school. Imagine if a high schooler tried to write this. It would come out something weird like this. Now, this is an adult person, presumably, with a, an adult level of intelligence, an adult level education, and an adult's emotional fortitude. And they have reacted to being rejected from law school after not completing their, their application requirements. They did not take the LSATs and they did not turn in an LSAT score. So they can't go to law school. And they've taken that news as if it is this tremendous infringement upon their constitutional right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Well, they are 100% wrong. And I think they're a sovereign citizen. And we know how that ends. Citizens are not sovereign. State is sovereign. And if you don't like that, go find some place to be sovereign. You don't have the power. I don't have the power. I would need to have a government's level of power in order to maintain my sovereignty. Or else the moment that I declared that I had territory that belonged to me and I had exclusive control over it, somebody was come and take it. We agree to live by the social contract implicitly, even though none of us was put here by consent. Yeah, certainly your parents may have consented to have sex with each other, but you didn't. You didn't consent to be born. I didn't consent to be conceived. I didn't consent to be circumcised. I didn't consent to be born. I get that people feel like rules are being imposed on them and they didn't have a choice. However, we live in reality where the four laws are not common law, statutory, code, and whatever. <clears throat> the four laws are the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. I'm not kidding. Those are the real laws. Everything else is fair game. So if Edward Thomas Kennedy actually declared his sovereignty, some government or even some person would simply flatten him, kill him, and take his land. Because he doesn't have the rule of law to protect him. He doesn't have a social contract to protect him. And there would be no consequences in my hypothetical scenario, because this real scenario doesn't exist. But there would be no consequences to taking said land from Crimea. I mean, from Edward Kennedy. So 
that's what that's about, man. We all agree to the social contract because I want to live. And I want to live with the most chance for opportunity and advancement and health and happiness and liberty and, and all that. And so to maximize my chances at having life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness be a real thing that happens to Leonard French, yeah, I'm going to cooperate and I will continue to advance my participation in the social contract that we all more or less agree to live by. Concepts of justice and fairness and all that still apply. You're allowed to be upset that you think the LSATs and all of these universities and all that are against you. You can be upset about that. That is your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness right there. If it makes you happy to hold a grudge like this for the rest of your life, go for it. I know it doesn't make you happy. I know I'm being hyperbolic, but you get it. Like, if this... Whatever you need to do to make yourself happy, great. You have the right to do it, but you do not have the right to swing your fists when you're going to hit my face or anything else for that matter. Or even when you're going to put me in common law, assault, reasonable intimidation or reasonable uh, belief that you're about to commit an offense or a bodily injury. So even a swipe at the camera like that, you know, if that was a person, that would be close enough that that would be considered common law assault. I'm sorry that this person doesn't seem to get these concepts. Instead, they tried to very egocentrically write to the judge as if the judge has to do what they say. And that's not at all true. The judge has to do what the law says. And so even if Edward Thomas Kennedy is a sovereign citizen, even if he did successfully have his own country and his own sovereignty, etc., he has just written to a judge in a different country. He has just written to a judge with a different set of laws and tried to say, no, 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 Edward Kennedy's law applies, not the sovereign law of the other sovereign country. And he's doing so trying to use United States law, Canadian law, British law from 800 years ago, the, the Magna Carta, the British law, Canada, I get it, Canada and America, United States of America are not 800 years old, but he's trying to use the Magna Carta from 800 years ago as if that has some kind of, of force. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And I, I have to stop talking because otherwise I'm going to keep going because this really <laughs> just baffles me. Whew. What are your thoughts on that? I love that like 45 minutes into reading the document, you were like, oh my God, this is a sovereign citizen. <laughs> That was like the best moment of that entire reading. <laughs> Accidental sovereign citizen. All right, everyone, that's our show. Thank you very much for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you very much to all of our supporters, especially to our supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench. In September, our $50 plus supporters are Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mentane, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Grunkle Tia Marie, Terry Crisp, Richard Fortier, and Michael Jones. And thank you very much to the $200 plus $5 plus supporters scrolling on the LED panel behind me somewhere back there. There you go. And on the crawl of the videos on demand that drop. Yeah, that was a pretty epic Sovereign Citizen case. So I'm looking forward to producing that for stream. All right, I'm going to go get ready for my movie and have a good week learning how to ride my one wheel. Thank you very much everyone for that. All right, everybody, have a good week. Say goodbye to Nico. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I will see you later.